Hello? All right. Good morning, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Our first presentation is on traffic signal and data innovation in Austin. That will be given by Lance Ballard. Lance is a tra transportation engineer at Kimley Horn, specializing in traffic signal operations, ITS, and data analytics. Lance was a Georgia ITE member and worked on numerous traffic signal operations and ITS projects in Georgia prior to moving to Austin in 2019. Lance currently serves as the manager of the Austin Mobility Management Center, which operates a thousand signals within the city of Austin. Lance, take it away. Thank you. It's nice to have a warm welcome back to Summer Seminar. It's been five years since I've been here, so it truly is an honor and a privilege to uh, chat with you all today. A little bit about some of the things that I've done in the last four or five years since we last spoke that I think maybe you could benefit and hopefully be inspired by. Um, so in Austin at the Mobility Management Center, we manage 345 uh, miles of arterial um, throughout the city. We've got 1,100 signals, a whole bunch of cameras, dynamic message signs, um, and 771 school zone beacons as well. And we do all the kinds of things that a uh, traffic management center does, right? So we're responding to service requests. We're um, unfortunately managing more weather um, responses than we would like to. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but we're also, in addition to special events and some things we'll hit on, I'll talk a lot about data analytics as well and how we're trying to turn that data into action. So one of the things I took with me from Georgia to Austin was how we really approach special events, especially um, after the Super Bowl, Mercedes-Benz Stadium, and a lot of lessons learned there. We've applied a lot of those similar techniques to um, our events in Austin, which really is a hotbed for events. Austin City Limits Music Festival, South by Southwest Media Conference. We have our own MLS team, University of Texas football. Um, Formula One is there, bringing in almost half a million people over the course of a weekend in October. So we are busy, busy, busy with events. Um, and we, in fact, used some of those techniques from Mercedes-Benz Stadium to run you know, pedestrian flush plans used and hack preemption to um, really flush traffic out after events. This is a, people leaving ACL. You'll see a long pedestrian flush to cross one of our major arterials near, near the event site. Um, so we, we took some things from Georgia to say, hey, this is working really well here. I hope this presentation is going to say, hey, here's some things we're doing in Austin that I think maybe y'all should um, take with you from today's presentation. One of them was off the heels of that special event um, operation. So I worked with Jared Wall while he was at the city of Austin prior to his move to join you. Um, and he was doing the signal timing around Bowie High School, an extremely large high school in Southwest Austin. Um, and they were extremely large and extremely um, diligent in their feedback about how things were going. <laughs> Um, and so they just kept saying, we would like this long green to clear out buses while high school lets out. And we said, hey, that sounds kind of familiar. It sounds a lot like what PD was telling us after events. Can you just give us a whole bunch of green time? We're like, yeah, signals don't really work that way. But we knew we could hack preemption to try to do it. So we just scheduled a preemption to give them exactly what they wanted. Um, so rather than go to a small plan for 10 or 15 minutes, transition through everything, Let's just run a preemption whenever the school plan is active. At a certain time, turn on a special function. There's some logic that says, hey, once that phase is about to come up, jump into the preemption and activate it um, and dwell for 70 seconds. And then don't do that again for a long time. And then by that time, the schedule is off. And it looks like this. So you're looking at a historical timing report that shows um, what that signal does during that time period. The red box highlights and shows that, hey, the blue section there provides a significantly longer portion of green time for the exit of the school traffic. So it's really flushing out all those buses at, at one point. And we basically made this deal. We said, hey, if you can guarantee the buses are all leaving at 445, we can do this for you. They went from being um, extremely diligent with their feedback, as I mentioned earlier, to um, not really having many complaints at all. Um, and so kudos to Jared for working on that when I first arrived to Austin. Um, another thing that we like to do that's pretty, pretty much become standard practice in Austin is how we treat T intersections. So if you have one left turn lane 
and one right turn lane. This is our preferred setup. We put flashing yellow arrows for both of them. And then we do um, what I'll call an option phasing, where if there's no pedestrian, everybody gets green arrows. There's no conflict, just sail on through, here you go. If there are pedestrians, instead you get a flashing yellow arrow. It provides a lot of benefits. I'll say how it works and then talk through some of those benefits as well. So pretty standard ring um, setup. You lag three and seven, right, so that you put enough time on four and eight so that you can cover that pedestrian movement. Um, if that is not actuated, nobody pushed the button, it just skips it, and three and seven can take that time um, and use that for a green arrow. Otherwise, whenever um, PEDs are activated, you get that flashing yellow arrow um, instead of a green arrow. And it looks like this. So this is one of our heavier pedestrian areas around the lake in downtown Austin. We have a big hike and bike trail you can see in the far background. If you look in the red box to the left, um, that left turn, no peds are crossing it right now, so they have green arrows. Um, to the right turn, you see a flashing yellow arrow, flashing yellow arrow, um, a pedestrian crossing, and even a blank outside that says, hey, yield to peds and bikes. Um, so it's not only I think a more efficient operation. It's really effective. It also provides a higher level of safety. Um, so we do this all over the place. It's our standard setup for T intersections at this point, and I think you should consider it as well. Another thing that we think is greater LPIs, leading pedestrian intervals. We put them all over the place. Uh, pretty much if you're in Austin and you ask for one, we will most likely give it to you. Um, it provides Great safety benefits, the traveling public loves it. Um, but if you don't have a dedicated right turn signal indication, it delays everybody, right? We're trying to delay the conflict between right turning vehicles and pedestrians that are trying to cross, um, but we have to hold everybody up to do that. If you have a right turn lane though, there's a better way. So if you have a dedicated right turn lane like in this image, um, and we can install a flashing yellow arrow for the right turn as well, I can put a delay on that flashing yellow arrow, which is essentially an LPI for only the right turn. So while this ped is crossing, we put a delay here for five, 10 seconds, whatever you would like that to be. Our through movement can go ahead and start at the very beginning and we get more efficiency. You don't have as much lost time for them. And we're really only limiting the movement that conflicts with the pedestrian. So by splitting out and providing a separate indication for that right turn movement, um, adding a delay on that flashing yellow arrow. We've really improved things for everybody. Um, so they would get a green arrow with its parent left turn just per normal, and instead they get a, a flashing yellow arrow while the ped is on and that's delayed as well. So really great safety improvement that really doesn't hurt you from any efficiency perspective. So it's kind of a win-win. So you should be doing this as well. A little bit more fun with flashing yellow arrows and logic. Um, here we have a large freeway, uh, Loop 1 in West Austin. Um, this is kind of a large arterial, lots of neighborhoods back behind here. Um, this movement eastbound towards the interchange can queue up significantly. Um, and it would queue through this intersection, making this left turn lane challenge, or this left turn movement challenging. Um, especially considering lane utilization is poor. Lots of people are stacking on the inside lanes here to try to make a left turn to go north on Loop 1, May, while the outside lanes are still clear and sometimes frequently vehicles moving faster than you'd like and creating angle crashes because of poor sight distance, things like that. You would say, okay, during the PM peak, just protect that left turn, protect it only during that time, problem solved, no big deal. Well, it varies a lot during, over the course of the day. It's not really, you know, there can be incidents on the freeway, there can be all kinds of things that might affect that. So we said, why don't we just have the detection determine it for us? So instead we say, whenever this detector is occupied above a certain threshold of time, omit this flashing yellow arrow, make this protected only, using logic. Um, so just another idea that we're using in Austin that I think you could benefit from if we've got the detection there, let that determine when that sort of operation should occur. Um, we're also pretty progressive with how we approach bike signals. We've got 29 locations throughout our 
the city, some under interim approval, some are experimentation. But the biggest issue we face with um, bicycle signals is cyclists trusting them or not. They're like, does it actually see me? Seems like it hasn't come up in a long time. I'm just going to go anyway. Hard to blame them. Um, so we try to provide where we can, especially at locations where we have contraflow cycle track or de cycle track dedicated facilities, and they're the only thing that would be detected as opposed to an adjacent vehicle. Um, we try to provide some indication to that if they got detected or not. And it started um, with just, hey, there's this blue light. When this blue light is on, you're being detected. Um, blue lights aren't necessarily you know, the standard just like, oh, hey, I know if that blue light's on, it's detected. I have to read a sign. I have to look at it. So we've started to move to um, this pedestrian head with a face that's a little tough to see in the picture, but it just says bike detected. And that comes on whenever we've detected someone there and they can know and trust how I'm being seen. I should wait. I'm going to get my time. Um, so just a couple other bike examples of things that we're doing. We really try to be proactive with rolling these out where it makes sense. Um, you know, basically, if it's anything other than just a bike lane right next to a travel lane, we're trying to signalize it in some capacity to provide that service to our traveling public. <laughs> Here's one where we've got a contraflow cycle track, and we have a sign that says, hey, left turn bicyclist yield on a green ball. Just FYI, be careful. Yield, <laughs> you do not have the right of way to make a left turn across oncoming traffic. Here's an intersection with our preferred T configuration with a, bi a bike lane right in the middle of it. And so we put a bicycle signal for them because sometimes, you know, you'd see this green arrow for someone to turn right or turn, or turn left. Well, they're going straight. No other vehicles are doing that. So we give them a bike signal right smack in the middle. Um, heard a lot of talk about PHBs over the last day or so, um, which we're excited to hear. We roll out a ton of them. Um, in fact, you'll see some of the numbers and stats on that. Um, because in Austin, we found that some of the locations that we saw that really needed a PHB didn't really meet the threshold for those 20 um, crossings per hour, and it was because there weren't enough gaps for people to cross. People wanted to cross. There was latent demand that was not being measured. And so we really moved kind of to more of a um, scoring criteria evaluation for where we should put in new PHBs. And it takes into things like where's the nearest crossing, how far is that. Obviously, the further it is, the more heavily it's needed. Um, speed limits, crashes, is it on the safe route to school um, network. And all of this is uh, readily available online. We can also send, happy to send you any of the information on how we score these. We're really trying to avoid things like this, right? We've got two bus stations kind of mid-block near some grocery stores, heavy pedestrian traffic generators. But if you were to want to cross at the next available crossing, you're walking a quarter mile just to make that trip. People aren't going to do that. They don't do that. Um, and so PHBs really provide a much greater level of safety for that. And we're working hard to try to put more of them out there. We crossed over and installed our 100th in the city of Austin last year, um, which if you're doing the math and the numbers from earlier, that's about 10% of all of our signals are PHBs. Um, and we're well on our way to 150. Um, one other kind of innovation and thing that you might consider is the MUTCD says, hey, maybe don't put these things at intersections. And we said, eh, it actually works pretty decent. Um, we have put some at intersections because that's where people are crossing, right? That's where people are coming up the sidewalk. They're intersecting with another roadway. Not all of them are mid-block. So let's help them cross safely. Maybe a traffic signal doesn't warrant today but a PHB does. So in this location on South Congress, a very uh, busy part of town for us, just south of downtown, we put up a PHB to help people cross at this intersection that didn't warrant a traffic signal yet, but it did a few years later. And we use that same infrastructure to convert it to a full signal. Um, use the same pole, mast arm, and all of that. So um, I am all for the MUTCD is a great guiding document. But I just wanted to show you a way that we're kind of innovating and finding some success within the guidance um, and limitations that it has. Another one that might be a little interesting to you um, is we remotely reset our conflict monitors. If we have a camera there and we can access it and see what the failure is, 
How different is that than us just going there and pushing the button looking around as well? I know many of you could probably raise your hand because you've been out there after a storm and it was just a red failure, power just went off and back on, didn't come back up how it's supposed to, and you know you gotta just send somebody to go push the button to get it operating again. We can do that remotely. Last year we did 275 of them. When you add up all the delay savings from act, getting somebody out there, especially some of these larger intersections that are just waiting for someone to push the button and you've got a miles long queue, that's a lot of delay savings, also staff savings, close to half a million dollars last year of benefit um, from using this. So something to consider. Um, I will note that we only reset red fails and things like that. We don't reset conflicts. It's not going to work anyway, but just FYI. So with the last few minutes here talking about how we turn some data into action, um, the previous presentation talked a lot about um, signal performance measures data. We have that. We utilize NREC signal analytics as well to get some of that probe-based signal um, performance data. We have, or sit at the nexus of a lot of data sources, asset management data, where our service requests are coming from, all that sort of stuff, and we're trying to achieve a bunch of tasks, so can we marry those into a bunch of dashboards that actually help us do something um, that aren't just nice visuals to say, oh, those look nice, we wanna make signal improvements. Um, so we just rank order some of our service um, requests and say, hey, where are the top 10 locations over the past month where people are complaining about signal timing? Well, 10 locations in our network is about 1% of our network. They were responsible in this month for about 10% of our complaints. So if we spend our time there, we can be incredibly impactful and effective with our time. Um, so we're creating dashboards and tools like this to help us where you can quickly hover over, see trends, and things like that. I mentioned that, unfortunately, we are establishing a tradition of bad Februaries um, in Texas. Um, this is in Austin covered in snow and we were impacted by large power outage events and even just thunderstorms in the spring. Um, we've developed some dashboards to help us track and respond to that and also communicate our response to our management. Um, so this is a dashboard right now it doesn't show anything in the current status but if this were an active event it would show you know how many signals are currently flashing or dark. Where do we have knockdowns? You would have a map to the right to show you where all of those are. What groups do we have responding? And then cumulative stats. Um, this not only helps us track and manage our response better, it also helps us manage our management better whenever they're calling and asking what's the status. We say, look at the dashboard, it's live, it's working. Um, so they're better informed and we're able to execute really well. So last bit here. We look to identify issues and act on them, right? Like I mentioned, we want to adjust operation and measure those improvements. Last year, using NRIC signal analytics, data from our ATMS system, kits that connects to all of our signals, service request data, and also just us proactively finding incidents and adjusting timings for those. We had about 120 times that we took some sort of proactive action like that that we tracked. When you add up all the delay numbers and savings, it was close to $800,000 of delay improvement. These are all issues that we identified through you know, some of these dashboards, some of these tools that we stood up through data proactively that otherwise would not have get, gotten noticed um, in that same amount of time or gotten noticed at all. So actively finding issues, trends, so that we can make improvements has been a big part of what we do a myriad of examples of other ways that we're doing this, but just w was happy to provide some of these today to give you an insight of what I've been up to lately since I haven't seen you in the past five years and some things that I thought might be beneficial um, for y'all to think about here in Georgia. So immensely um, grateful to be back with y'all. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, looking forward to any questions you might have later. Thank you, Lance. <clears throat> Are there questions now? Anyone have any questions? Yeah. Yes, sir. Do you have any innovative way of uh, managing your detectors when they fail on you? How do you find the failures innovatively? If, if, if sure. Fail? Yeah, a couple of ways. Um, so our ATMS, or yeah, our ATMS system kits that looks at all of our detection has some signal health reporting metrics that looks at, similar to the ATSPM watchdog, um, reports, looks overnight and says, hey, are there detectors that are stuck on at 2 a.m.? 
um, things like that. So we found a lot of pedestrian detectors that break. We find them quickly. Um, vehicle detectors as well. There's even been a few locations where in the signal performance measures data, we found locations like, hey, this got a lot worse all of a sudden. What's the deal over here? It's the, our, our intersection that is the worst, has the worst trend in the last month compared to its rolling average. And we look, oh, detection went bad. Um, so we've actually had that tell us that some of our detection isn't working as well. Um, so it's kind of partly the system, also the performance of the system itself. Yes, sir. Hello, testing. All right. We got hey, Lance, you. great, great job. Appreciate it. Um, out of the DHPs that you guys have installed, uh, how many approximately would you say you utilize that priority scoring evaluation, or maybe the existing pedestrian volume wasn't meeting that guidance? Sure. Um, as to how many of them do or do not meet that kind of MUTCD threshold, I, I can't tell you, but all of ours that we end up constructing and delivering have gone through that scoring evaluation because that's also what we use to prioritize need. Um, so all of them go through that scoring criteria and essentially we're rolling out as many as we can fund each year through that prioritization list um, because most all of them have some sort of need, yeah. Hey Lance, we have a question from an online okay, watcher yes. regarding the PHBs at intersections. Yes. Have you had to put supplemental heads on the side street or, and or adjust stop bar placement? Okay, good point. Yes, I meant to mention this when I went through it the first time. So some of the, the main concern there is side street vehicles, right, having no indication. They're already not looking for an indication. They're looking for a gap in traffic to make their movement, right? Because they're just stop controlled. So they're already looking around actively trying to make sure, is it safe for me to cross or not? Um, so they're incredibly engaged and involved in what's happening at the intersection. And when they see people stopping to let a pedestrian cross, they also see that pedestrian crossing. And if anything, we've also just created a gap for them to more easily enter um, the roadway. Um, so we've, we have not had to put an additional um, signal indication to my knowledge, Jared, you probably, like, we haven't had to do that. It's really not a problem that we have found. Um, and I would say there's another point I was going to make and it left me, but if it comes back later, I'll think of it. I think we had another question. Oh, have we had, had to adjust the stop bars? Um, not to my knowledge, but some of them might have been updated just as we put in the PHB just to refresh them. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, question, question, Lance. Uh, uh, where we had to convert a PHB from a two-stage to a one-stage, mm. um, vehicles were constantly running over the, the pet displays in the middle of the, um, yeah. of the island. Any tips on just delineation? We've done some things, but vehicles are still running over <laughs> all the pet displays. Yeah, we have some locations that have pedestrian heads at the corners of intersections that frequently get struck and things as well. Um, I don't know that I have any pro tips on delineation. I know that we try to avoid two-stage crossings if at all possible um, because often those median environments are not a fun place to be for very long and people will not want to wait if at all possible. Um, so we typically, and even in planning for major projects right now with TxDOT and I-35 being completely rebuilt through downtown, we're saying, hey, we want the width of some of these frontage roads to be such that we're not, we're not want to do a two-stage crossing even if they're kind of more of a boulevard type roadway rather than um, separated frontage roads. So um, we really try to avoid those if possible. As far as delineation goes, we have lots and lots of bollards, knockdown sticks around that we have to maintain a lot. Um, and we find that they're effective, but they do have a lot of maintenance needs because they do get struck frequently. So I think that's the best I can do there. Yes. I had a question. Thank you for the presentation. So for the, the bike signals that y'all use, if there's a turning movement in conflict with that bicycle, bicycle phase, is the conflicting phase solid red while the bike phase is green, or y'all use flashing yellow arrows? Um, I see, yeah. So we will allow a flashing yellow arrow across a 
green ball of a bike phase, I believe. Um, we will, in the instance that I showed where bikes yield to oncoming traffic, um, that's for if they were turning, like left turning bicycles, because you could turn from there into a bike lane to go a different direction. Um, I believe we allow flashing yellow arrows, but obviously not a green arrow or anything like that. There are locations where we might make that an exclusive um, bike phase if, uh, if needed. Thanks very much, y'all. Appreciate it. Thank you, Lance. We'll move to the next presentation. All right, while that loads, I'll introduce our next presenter. Um, Matt D'Angelo. Matt is a Georgia native and Gresham Smith Transportation Systems Management and Operations Practice Leader. For the last 25 years, Matt has served clients across the U.S., including the Federal Highway Administration, state DOTs, toll authorities, and local agencies. Matt currently supports ITE, the Transportation Research Board, ITS America, and ITS state chapters on advancing emerging technologies and operational strategies to create healthy and thriving communities. Outside of his profession, Matt supports his church community and shares his life with his wife, Mary, who graciously tolerates his electric guitar hobby. Uh, Matt's gonna present on I-24 motion and MRI for traffic. Okay. First of all, I definitely want to acknowledge the core team for this project, um, starting with uh, Tennessee Department of Transportation, Lee Smith, who's the operations director and really the champion, uh, Michelle Nickerson, who is the project manager for I-24 Motion. Um, this is also a collaboration with Vanderbilt University, specifically Dr. Dan Work, who's the principal investigator, and Dr. Will Barber. And then Gresham Smith is supporting this. Our project manager is Dr. Meredith Sibelak. Okay, so why, this is not advancing. Okay, so why build a test bed? Well, one of the things we know about transportation science is that it involves these pesky things called humans, and they behave in strange ways. And so our observation of that traffic behavior, as well as our ability to sense that behavior, is key to understanding really how transportation science works. We've also been here before. Um, all of a sudden, stop and go conditions, you're not sure what in the world is up ahead. You get up ahead, you see nothing going on at all. Uh, we've been describing these as uh, phantom traffic waves or this oscillatory behavior that you see uh, in stop and go conditions on facilities. And then we have this coming at us very quickly. So here is an example of a highly automated vehicle. Um, and as you'll see, as it approaches this uh, underpass, it'll struggle to make the merge movement. And so we have a new vehicle type that's being introduced into our traffic fleet as well that will also behave differently than our human drivers as well. Hence the motivation for creating a test bed. So I-24 motion, it does actually stand for something, um, but really the, the idea here was to create a, an open road test bed environment where we could understand traffic science in a much deeper way, but also how some of these new factors that are affecting the traffic stream could be measured and then help us to refine our traffic operations strategies. Uh, I-24 Motion is a four mile section along Interstate 24 south of Nashville. This is the most congested uh, corridor in the state of Tennessee. It has about 18% truck traffic. This is a major freight uh, crossroads uh, for the country. Um, and uh, is invariably an, uh, an area that experiences a lot, of, uh, a lot of congestion. So it's kind of a great study area to, to look at this. 
Um, so also um, uh, what we're looking at here is uh, an extremely dense installation of 4K cameras. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about how that works, but first a little bit of background. Is anyone here familiar with the NGSIM data set? Okay, so back in 2006, some researchers put some cameras on top of some buildings in San Francisco to observe traffic behavior along Interstate 80. Researchers then painstakingly took that data and created traffic trajectories that basically established the car following models that are used in the simulation tools that you, that you use today. So this was back in 2006. Uh, that generated about 1,800 vehicle miles travel worth of data uh, that was used for the research community and then the simulation um, community. Um, advance in, in time a bit, uh, the HiD project, which is drone-based in Germany, uh, generated about 25,000 VMT. I-24 Motion takes it to the next step. We're generating 200 million vehicle miles travel per year by continuously analyzing, co collecting trajectory data for every single vehicle in this four mile segment. And our position, and this is not probes, this is not uh, waypoints, so this is continuous, this is the analog version. It is continuous through the four mile section at a positional accuracy of around you know, a few inches to no more than a foot of error. So it's, it's a very precise data set uh, for trajectories. In terms of data generation, this is a massive, gener massive data generator uh, 31 petabytes per year for the video. For obvious reasons, that is not recorded. Uh, it's way too much data. Uh, but we process that 31 terabytes of video imagery into 11 terabytes a year of trajectories. Again, it's every single vehicle in this four mile segment. All right, so how did we build this? Well, first of all, it started out with Let's do some experimentation first with a validation system to figure out, okay, what are the limits of the camera technologies? We're really pushing the limits of what we're trying to do with video-based imagery and then being able to process that imagery. How far apart should the poles be? Uh, how tall should the poles be? So we use the lessons learned to kind of refine the implementation plan for the full build-out uh, of the test bed. One of those things involved creating a novel device. So uh, the, the cameras, you have six 4K cameras per pole. Uh, these poles are at least 110 feet high, which necessitated the use of a camera lowering device. But in order to transport six 4K resolution video cameras just down the pole, we had to put a gigabit ethernet switch inside the camera lowering device just to transport the data down to the cabinet. And from there, it eventually links into a 40 gig network to just transport the video data alone. Uh, so we had a custom lowering device that was created to do this. We called, affectionately called the Beetle. Um, along this four mile section, 40 poles, uh, 276 continuous cameras. And then where we had interchanges, we actually put dual Beetles. So we have 12 4K cameras so that we could capture vehicle behavior at the interchanges, including the nearby signals. This was needed to be done in an extremely compressed time frame. Um, design, we had about six weeks, really realistically to put the plans together so that we could make the bid schedule. Um, we did some clever things with procurement to advance procure the poles because at that time there was an issue with steel availability. Um, this was built right in the middle of COVID. Uh, during construction, numerous challenges, which we're all familiar with now on the supply chain side, uh, pretty much had to redesign some of the network switches because Cisco couldn't get us the ones that were actually planned for the project, again, due to global supply chain issues. Um, so a lot of challenge, challenges were overcome to implement the system in a very short time frame. So here's where the magic really happens. So um, Vanderbilt's part in this was creating the video processing to create 3D bounding boxes of every single vehicle, not the typical 2D stuff that you see uh, in most video processing, um, that's, uh, that's available today. And so what they're doing is stitching together every single vehicle's trajectory across all cameras so there's absolutely no occlusion or loss of data in this four mile section. That's a very hard scientific problem to fix. Thankfully, they've got all kinds of smart people who did that, came up with the, the algorithms to do that. Um, and so that's really some of the new science that was created as part of the, the test bed. So let's talk about the first experiment that was used on Notion. So why do we have a compressed time schedule? Well, the, top, the clock was ticking on an experiment known as Circles. Uh, Circles is a consortium 
project that involves five universities, three automotive OEMs, um, and uh, TDOT saw an opportunity to support circles. This is a Department of Energy funded grant that wanted to understand can today's uh, ADAS type systems, so advanced driving assist systems, could they have a measurable impact if deployed at scale in our traffic stream on energy use? That was the question DOE wanted to answer. Um, we also found that in close course, course testing um, that uh, ADAS certainly could improve, improve the stability of the traffic flow, but to do something in a closed course is very different from doing something in a live environment. So TDOT said we are going to provide the live environment to support the circles test. And so uh, if you're familiar with your adaptive cruise control that's pretty commonly available today, uh, so the picture on the left, the way this works, is you set your desired speed and your following distance. And so um, these uh, stock systems were tested as part of the circles experiment. But in addition to that, on the right, was a, a research-specific adaptive cruise control system that was dynamically adapting the target speed and the following distance to see if it could mitigate these phantom traffic waves that we were observing. So some, here's some examples of just cycling through what that looked like from a driver's perspective. So to pull this off uh, was a massive logistical feat. So uh, Nissan very generously gave the project 100 vehicles, new vehicles um, to use for the experiment, uh, which were used over the course of a week. There are over 150 drivers who had to be recruited in order to cover all the times that we needed to do the testing. Um, and uh, these, uh, obviously there was a lot of safety related uh, implications to make sure these drivers, um, you know, knew how these vehicles were going, you know, should behave and what to do in the event of something unexpected happened. Uh, most important outcome of the, of the experiment, um, at, at least uh, as the conclusion of the experiment was, is there were no issues, there were no injuries, there was no problems uh, with the vehicles. Uh, they were safely returned to Nissan afterwards. Uh, but it was a pretty massive uh, logistical exercise. Okay, so now the fun part, the data. Uh, what can you do with that data? What you're looking at here is a time-space diagram of one morning. And so what you're seeing is every single vehicle in the traffic stream. Um, and so you're seeing these, these red bounded areas. These are, the, these are the propagating phantom traffic waves that were actually detected through, uh, through the experiment. And then the white lines that you see on the time-space diagram, those are the vehicles used in the experiment. Those were the 100 Nissan Rogue vehicles uh, that were used with the adaptive uh, uh, cruise control enabled. And so what the researchers are doing now is taking this kind of data um, and unpacking, okay, what was the effect? What was the measured effect on potentially reducing some of these uh, phantom traffic jams, jams that occur? If you look at this diagram, it looks more like, a, like an arterial, a signalized ar arterial. Um, but no, this is, this is an interstate system. Uh, so these are some of the types of things specifically that the science is trying to tackle. How can we address this and have a, a more holistic benefit on traffic? So what's next? What's possible for the test bed? Well, on June 20th, TDOT activated their very first integrated corridor management system that is also along the section of Interstate 24. Uh, that includes 20, about 28 miles of gantries spaced about every third to a half a mile with lane control signals, variable speed limits, uh, a number of other improvements for uh, signal timing on a parallel corridor with the idea of balancing demand across both the interstate system uh, and the parallel State Route 1 or Murfreesboro Road. First type of project of this kind in Tennessee, so obviously it's new to drivers. Um, and so one of the things that's already begun to happen is using the test bed data as a feedback loop to refine the artificial intelligence decision support system that's being used for this integrated corridor management system. And so really understanding how do drivers respond to these, to these X's and arrows. Um, you know, Lee Smith likes to, uh, you know, really wants to use a, uh, uh, a yellow angled arrow for these lane control signals. Currently FHWA doesn't allow that. Uh, but we'd like to run a little bit of an experiment to see how do drivers respond to the, the yellow X's versus the, the yellow arrows in terms of merge compliance and merge movements. So how do drivers actually respond to these active traffic management strategies? Um, in the future, uh, in the next phase of this project, uh, TDOT will introduce ramp metering to this corridor as well. Um, so again, something new that we can measure in real time 
how are these operational strategies actually working, how people are responding to them, what do we need to do to modify those strategies in order to make them more effective. Sort of like a continuous feedback loop that the test bed actually provides to day-to-day -day operations. We're also really interested in uh, driver compliance with moveover laws. So are we keeping our first responders protected with the types of warnings that we're putting out? Um, you know, this is an example of uh, this car over here that took out actually one of our cabinets for uh, the motion experiment. Uh, this was a couple of days before the circles experiment was, uh, was due to run. Um, so really, you know, understanding more deeply, you know, these types of issues could help protect not only, uh, you know, our infrastructure, but also our first responders. Here's an interesting one. So back to our time space diagram. So in the midst of the experiment, um, there was an upstream accident that occurred that all of a sudden was metering traffic. And so this domed area you see here where all of a sudden once you got into the experimental area uh, was free flow traffic. Um, and then as that traffic was cleared and that, you know, that meter that was created um, upstream of our test area was removed, you see these phantom traffic waves come back again. It kind of proves that, you know, that this condition is repeatable so if we have a strategy that's targeted towards it, um, we can understand the, the impacts and then also related incident-related impacts um, and how we can adjust some of our incident management strategies. This is the real fun one. Okay, so uh, we are heading towards uh, an environment here in our transportation space where it's becoming increasingly more collaborative with industry, uh, whether that's data sources or uh, or the features that are being introduced in vehicles. You know, we're no longer building infrastructure in isolation of the actual vehicle technologies. So we see tremendous uh, opportunity to work with automo automobile original equipment manufacturers and their tier one suppliers on the solutions that are being embedded in vehicles because here's the problem they have. They have great sensing on their vehicle. They do not have great sensing beyond their own vehicle. So to how to see their, how their vehicle is interacting with the overall traffic stream, we can complete the picture and fill in, fill in the blanks for them. Um, so there's, we've got interest in, in several auto manufacturers to participate, um, also the research community. So with that amount of data that's being generated, it's way too much data for one university to handle. And this really is intended to advance transportation science. Um, so we've got interest uh, uh, from the research, research community, both private and public. Uh, traffic simulation, if you're still building your car following models based on what was done in NGSIM, you've got an old data set. Uh, the traffic stream has changed. So updating those, those simulation models to more appropriately reflect the real traffic uh, mix, uh, and that mix is changing dramatically, right? So understanding that is going to make the simulation models far more effective uh, than they are today. Uh, I mentioned this, the, the freight side of this being a, such a massive freight corridor. Uh, if we do we get to the point of platooning, understanding driver behavior and reactions around the platoon, again, this is, this is new ground, this is new territory. Um, what can we do from an operational point of view to make sure if that strategy is put into place uh, that we're doing that in the most safe and effective and operational uh, effective manner? Uh, other infrastructure owners, so we've been talking about maybe doing a pooled fund study, particularly on the active traffic management parts, because there are other states you know, like Las Vegas that has an active traffic management system. Um, and so uh, Seattle as well. And so is there a way to do some lessons learned and sharing? So more to come on that, but uh, there is some interest from some other states to say, I think maybe we can learn some lessons here and apply them, port them over to our states. USDOT, they've expressed interest in their own R&D program and ways they can advance some of those research needs through uh, I-24 motion. And then I, the ITS vendor community, I mean, some new devices had to be created in order to make motion work. So the ability to kind of test those out and understand limits, uh, this, that has the ability in motion to, to take that and help them kind of advance their products as well. Okay, so as far as the data. Um, so the, the data is gonna be served out as an API that's gonna be freely available for researchers to consume or subscribers uh, you do have to sign a data, data use agreement and some basic things, uh, but basically it's going to be blasted out for anyone to use and be able to ingest to help them support their own research. So uh, that is coming. Uh, expect for that around the end of the year, uh, for that API to be published 
Uh, this is currently undergoing a, a peer review research right now to make sure the data stream meets all of the requirements of the circles experiment. So once that is done, you'll have an opportunity to start to subscribe to the data. Okay. So here's a QR code if you want to learn more about the test bed. Um, there's a lot of good information on here as well as this is where we're going to publish updates uh, as far as the experiments, the future experiments that are run on the test bed. And this also will give you a way to kind of sign up for updates and subscribe to the future data feed if you're interested in that. Okay, with that, we'll take any questions. This is interesting research. This is fascinating. Uh, we've all in this room experienced what, what your video is showing. One thing you haven't mentioned at all is the, the drivers themselves. Is there anything you can do with what you've learned with this video technology and the trajectories and so forth to better educate the drivers to what is going on out there? It's my contention that these drivers don't know what they're doing, so they keep doing what they're doing because they don't know what they're doing. And if, if you could explain what the drivers are doing, maybe they would learn and not do what they keep doing to create this phantom, whatever you call it, you know, that's occurring. Yeah, yeah, that's a uh, great point. And, um, you, you know, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. And we you think in this case, um, it could be a powerful um, public outreach tool. So in advance of the Smart Corridor project, which was run in parallel with, with I-24 Motion, um, TDOT did a tremendous amount of advanced publicity. This is something brand new. Not sure how Tennessee drivers are going to react, you know. And, you know, and some of the early results were pretty predictable, right? You know, variable speed limit signs, they're in Georgia as well. Compliance is very low, right, because they're not enforced. So there was a lot of effort to kind of get public outreach to say this is the purpose of it, this is the benefit of it. Um, but I anticipate that this is going to need to be continually reinforced, right? If you know, TDOT's considering these, expanding these smart corridors to other locations in the state. Maybe not the same mix of infrastructure, but there has to be that public side along with it for the public awareness. So it's a great point, you know, is using this to communicate back to the public of, hey, this is what your tap and go behavior, or, you know, okay, I'm gonna look down at my cell phone now and, you know, you know, the things we see over and over again that, that reduce the available capacity to efficiently move people, yeah, absolutely. I think it could be used as a feedback tool. We just have to put it in public terms, you know, not in research terms, you know, and turn off, you know, the engineering side and get more into the public awareness side. Yes, sir, Mr. Holt. Hey, Matt, good presentation. Um, my question is with those beetle configurations and the six cameras per pole arrangement, how are, my recollection is it's like eight lane cross section through there on I-24. So how are those six cameras focusing on traffic in eight lanes? And is, is one camera generally look at one lane or is it just the first one to get picked up with the, you know, what, what, how does that work from a processing standpoint sure. using those six beetle configured cameras? Okay, so the, so the first part is this is a directional test bed. Um, so this is only capturing the, the westbound traffic, which would be the morning peak. Um, the cameras themselves are not focused on a specific lane. They're actually, you know, they're all kind of zoomed out with the idea being that what the researchers are doing through some pretty intensive graph graphical processing hardware is they're actually examining every frame of every video of every camera and then stitching together and saying, okay, I get the first indication of that vehicle in, you know, let's say camera one on the Beetle, and then my last one on camera six. And then they use that and then stitch those across poles that are spaced about 500 feet apart to create this continuous trajectory. So they're not focusing on a specific lane, uh, but what they are doing is basically saying, I can verify the content in each frame and then stitch that together through some new science around homography that actually creates that continuous trajectory. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Matt.
All right, our next presenter, Jerry DeCamp, uh, has, been practice, has been a practicing traffic signal operations field engineer in Texas and Nevada for almost 40 years now, including 11 years with the city of Dallas and another 10 years as the manager of the Las Vegas area computer traffic system before entering private practice in 2000. His professional contributions include the original development of the so-called Dallas Display Protective Permissive Left Turn Signal, a predecessor to the modern flashing yellow arrow display, and popularization of advanced signal sequencing, which serves critical movements twice per cycle at a diamond interchange and other complex intersections. Jerry maintains his PE licensure in Texas and Nevada, is a fellow life member of ITE, and was named the Tech Site Transportation Engineer of the Year in 2008. Jerry? Thanks, Jared. <laughs> okay, let me see how much I can uh, get through this. Uh, where's the go button? Uh, what I wanted to pitch uh, uh, today basically is uh, uh, ways you can use modern traffic signal controllers uh, to help us uh, uh, help with some problems uh, uh, we've got. Uh, when chat will set up the session, uh, 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 he, sa he said he wanted uh, uh, to let you all hear how some things are done in other parts of the country. and. Uh, 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 one real obvious one is uh, back in Texas, we usually prefer to use a single traffic signal controller to run compound intersections, such as expressway interchange signals. Um, uh, because they can do a way better job of keeping one side in step of, of with the other when you can break that into your sequence than, uh, 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 than if you have two separate machines. It can be done with two separate machines. I've had to do it with the right peer message uh, uh, rig, but it's a whole lot more surefire if you're uh, controlling all that out of one box. Uh, on the left, you probably recognize a simplified version of the classic Texas TTI phasing, with which I still have a love-hate relationship. Um, uh, the good news is it keeps uh, all the left turn movements moving nice and cleanly through the inside of your diamond. The bad news is the price you pay is you're only really moving, it's the interchange equivalent of uh, split phasing both streets at a regular intersection and then servicing the four approaches one at a time in clockwise rotation. Uh, meaning any one approach is gonna be uh, red about three quarters of the time and green uh, uh, the remaining other quarter. Um, uh, but the good news is that if you don't have a whole lot of space between your expressway service roads, uh, 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 you don't hold anybody to speak of uh, inside the diamond. The, the so-called classic three-phase sequence where you run the throughs together and the, uh, 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 the inside lefts together, uh, then the service roads together, and then you can put a phase in there to allow each service road to, to, to gap out and drain what's turned left off the inside, is kind of the, at the opposite end of that spectra. It's using, it's moving one of the outside movements on each side of the diamond most of the time. Um, all of these, you can pretty well see how much uh, uh, more easily you can do this with, uh, 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 with a single controller than you can get two controllers to work with each other relying on coordinators that, uh, well, do I need to add five seconds to, uh, more to this offset? Now, you got that bricked in with your sequence if you've uh, written a, a good sequence. There are compromises uh, uh, between them. Uh, you can one, run one side leading and the other side lagging, uh, still maybe keeping the two cross street movements split phased. Um, and uh, uh, one I've gotten a good deal of practice with recently is uh, uh, left turn signals on the service roads. And Lance was mentioning uh, uh, some interesting applications that aren't described in the book directly uh, uh, for flashing yellow arrows. We're finding uh, 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 ones around uh, Houston. TTI phasing is 
heavily used in Texas, maybe more heavily than it ought to be in some other places that something else would be more efficient. Uh, whereas in most other states, it isn't used as often as uh, um, uh, maybe it would be a benefit uh, uh, to be used. I think there's a chicken and egg relationship uh, uh, there. Maybe the designers have tried to avoid going to CTI phasing because where you have two controllers, it's tough to get them to stay, uh, stay lined up. Um, but uh, we have a little problem in uh, Texas. We've got the motorists so used to TTI phasing that sometimes if you just have a, a, a service road green signal, you'll have a little wreck problem when somebody makes a left turn, pays no attention to the red lights on the uh, uh, inside at the other side, goes sailing right through them and kapow. Uh, we have had some good luck in the Houston Highway District with hanging up flashing yellow arrow left turn signals on the service road for that just uh, so they're not turning on a green. That has helped in Houston and San Antonio. Uh, uh, yes, you, um, uh, you can, with phase numbers higher than eight, uh, you can uh, actually set up twice per cycle services of certain critical movements uh, if you want to. Uh, didn't draft this up pretty, but uh, uh, what uh, this is is when you get into special sequence work, Grizzled old shop supervisors love to take a look at uh, of whatever you're proposing and this can't be done. Well, a table like this in your plans or uh, whatever paperwork you're writing up uh, does wonders to settle the argument where you list what field movement each load switch is actually driving the red, yellow, greens for, uh, what, in, what phase or overlap or uh, pet output drives it, and what the, uh, um, uh, well, what channels the conflict, uh, conflict monitor should be jumper legal, uh, that it should be legal with. If you've got a list like that, that'll settle, help settle those arguments uh, uh, pretty quick. Um, Here is another area that, as an industry, we're going to have to up our game uh, uh, on, and I got some ways to do it. Um, back in the uh, Back in the 80s, when I worked for the city, uh, uh, city of Dallas, uh, we could have a crosswalk across an 80-foot street, uh, give it four seconds of walk and 14 seconds of flashing don't walk, and you had maybe four seconds of yellow and a second of red, and that just met the four feet per second rule. So uh, uh, I guess what I'm saying is most pedestrian clearance times were usually back then at, uh, uh, at or less the amount of coordination split or phase max time, you'd want to give the vehicle movement on that phase anyway. So uh, pedestrians weren't the disruptor of things like coordination cycles they are today. Okay, the part of our game we're gonna have to up um, uh, is uh, uh, coming, up, uh, uh, coming up with ways to allow the signal controller to do more things while it's clocking out the long clearance times for some of those 140 foot long crosswalks we have out in Las Vegas. And you guys have some of, although it's not quite that bad, around here. Hello. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just telling you that. Yeah, back in the day, you had a walk value and a flashing don't walk value. Uh, uh, for each phase that had an associated pedestrian. These days, well, you have your walk time, you have your uh, LPI interval, if you like, or uh, um, uh, walk advance. Uh, you may have some sort of an audible output that, uh, um, uh, for disadvantaged users. Uh, flashing don't walk value, you want to uh, keep to one of because you'll confuse the little uh, countdown timer that's in the ped head if sometimes you have a shorter one and sometimes you have a longer one. Um, the uniform manual currently uh, does describe uh, uh, you can have longer walks and, uh, 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 and uh, t turn on your audibles uh, with an extended press of the pedestrian push button. Ooh, there we go. Um, okay ways to uh, allow the signal to serve more things during a long pedestrian clearance. OK. 
keep not hitting that right, you know what? There we go. Um, I actually got one of these implemented uh, on Ashford Dunwoody Road outside of Perimeter Mall uh, in DeKalb County a few years back. And from everything I was told, it worked, uh, uh, it worked uh, uh, re uh, real well. I've had conflicting reports on whether, uh, um, uh, on whether it's still out there this way. Um, Bruce Friedman, who was then the, uh, 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 the FHWA man in charge of uh, the single section of the book, assured me that what I was doing was entirely legal to his book. Um, basically, I allowed the, crosswalk, uh, the pedestrian crosswalks uh, across Ashford Dunwoody Road to run with both of the two split phase side street phases uh, and rigged the signal to kill the green arrow in the four section head on the cycles they came up. That's entirely legal to the book. Uh, it says two things. When your left turn movement is completely protected from oncoming traffic uh, uh, and pedestrian crosswalks uh, with a walk, you're supposed to tell the motorist that by lighting up a green arrow. If that protection is in any way less than complete, you're supposed to not point a green arrow across things like crosswalks with a walk. Uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we did that, and the traffic backups on Ashford Dunwoody Road that backed way up at 1 o'clock in the afternoon with all the office workers on the east side wanting to cross over to Perimeter Mall to eat lunch uh, and cross back um, largely evaporated when, uh, uh, when we did this because you didn't have two super long pedestrian uh, uh, clearances that were sequential with conventional phasing stealing all the time out of the main road. So it helped a whole lot. Uh, there is another version. Do I have that one? Um, there's a less aggressive version of that that uh, our colleague Mark Jacobson uses in San Antonio, Texas, by the way, uh, that still gives each pedestrian crosswalk its own, uh, 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 its own phase, but has the vehicle movements that turn le left across it as a conflicting phase. So you're on one of them leading, the other turn trailing. Sure, on a cycle you have both pedestrian uh, uh, crosswalks called. There can be 10, 15 seconds in the, uh, in the middle of the cross street service where no vehicles actually have a green movement, but you're, you've started one pedestrian crosswalk uh, after the first conflicting uh, uh, movement uh, while, uh, while the other one's still clearing. Uh, that's the one you'd want to go to if you had an optional dual left posted across one of the crosswalks and didn't want uh, the motorist trying to turn two at a crack uh, uh, across an active crosswalk. Uh, these last couple of slides are uh, 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 eight phase quad left versions of this sa uh, same general idea. Uh, where if you're uh, running a lead and a lag on both streets, you can kill vehicle movements and start a cross streets crosswalk while you're still cro uh, crossing a pedestrian clearance in, uh, 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 of, the, of the first street you're clearing. There's a, uh, there's a list of what phases can time concurrently with what other phases. And this is a lead lag version of that, uh, um, uh, that, that same idea. By the way, these sequences are doable particularly easily with the uh, Intellite MaxTime uh, uh, controller software in common use around here. Um, there are other, uh, uh, other softwares you can also uh, uh, make this idea work on, but uh, uh, depending on how far down the list you go, uh, uh, the more working around, well, working around their limitations gets involved. Um, so 
this is the kind of thing that phase numbers gra greater than eight and uh, uh, use of uh, timing in rings three and four, which most of the software you guys use these days all have, but it's rarely used. This is the kind of thing they're good for. Um, uh, yes, you can stagger and have rolling barriers. Uh, every time you set up a special one, it needs to be bench checked pretty thoroughly to, um, uh, to make sure it's doing what, it's easy to draw these uh, uh, sequences, you need to check them pretty carefully to make sure the machine's doing what you drew. Anyhow, that's all I got. Uh, no such thing as a presentation, it's too short, huh? Uh, <laughs> thought my explanations were that clear. <laughs> All right, thank you to our presenters, and that's it. Thank you for joining us.